On Scalarium, which is um, a management site that automates a lot of those things on, on, um, on Amazon. And this is like the, the way I interact with a lot of P big PHP developers um, and or big sites on, running on PHP. So, um, but, the, but the main focus, of course, Amazon Web Services. Um, who have, has uh, used already Amazon EC2 in this room? Oh, so a lot of, okay. So I can maybe uh, skip a lot of the, the uh, introductory um, stuff. Who uh, never um, or doesn't even know what Amazon EC2 really is, apart from maybe heard the word? So one or two, okay. Um, so the, the, the basic premise of Amazon EC2, it's, it's a very, very, very simple um, thing. It's a small change to, to hosting as you know it from uh, like traditional uh, virtual server hoster. You, you, get, um, you get a virtual um, Linux machine or a virtual uh, Windows machine or an open Solaris machine. Um, with, with total root access and you can do whatever you want uh, with it. The, the big difference um, is that you only pay by the hour and um, you can get, get a machine via an API call and you can get rid of it via an API call. Doesn't sound like a big difference, but um, in, in, in practice it's a really, really big one because um, if, if you architecture your, your application um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way and you, um, you have automation tools, you can... Um, achieve a solution where you always have exactly as many servers that you need. So, um, for example, I know a lot of people who shut down during the night half of their machines because they don't need them, who um, just have um, staging systems running for an hour or two a day where they test everything and then they shut it down. Or um, cope with, with um, of course, like the um, with um, big, loads, um, big spikes in load um, and to just use Amazon for scaling out this. Um, so this is the basic idea. I get a virtual server that I can pay for by the hour. There are a lot of um, additional features, additional services around it um, that, that uh, some of those I will, we will have a look at, but um, some of those are just complementary, like load balancing, um, there is a monitoring service, and so on. You, you can have virtual private um, uh, clouds, which is like the idea that, that I can only access machines via um, um, an encryption, uh, encrypted tunnel. And uh, there is, for example, spot instances, which is um, a very interesting concept where you can bid for a machine and only get the machine um, if your bid is high enough. Uh, which is, of course, of course not, uh, not uh, a good thing if your website is running on it, but um, if you have like asynchronous workers who are converting videos or something like that, um, where you don't care that it's running right now, it should only be running like sometime this week, um, it's a great, um, get great feature to, to save money. Um, so what do I have to do to run on EC2. What do I have to, to, uh, to know about Amazon EC2? Um, the, the basic steps are not, not as much different as from, from hosting on your own hardware or hosting in a traditional data center. You have to, um, to like come up with the idea, where do I want to, to have my servers? Um, I will talk about this in a minute. This is a little bit uh, different than, than uh, usually. You have, of course, to define what kind of architecture do I want to have, what kind of servers do I want to run, and then um, probably the, the, the um, bigger problem is how do I configure and boot my, my instances in an automated fashion? Because I can I could get the most benefit out of Amazon if I have everything automated, from bootstrapping the machine um, down to responding to load spikes. Um, so this is like our agenda, if, if you want so. Um, so what are those those regions and availability zone? And, and uh, I must tell you beforehand that uh, Amazon unfortunately has the the, uh, the 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 habit of naming things that everybody like understands it uh, like as a concept a little bit differently than, than you used to, yeah? So, um, and the first of those are regions and availability zones. So in Amazon that speak, there is no data center, there is an availability zone, whatever that means, right? So um, there are different regions in the world where Amazon has data centers. And uh, every region is an individual EC2 installation. That means that it's not so easy to transfer data or, or objects that you have in one of those regions to another one. Um, so they're really separated, um, which is a good thing. That, that means that even if like the whole uh, American EC2 installation has a problem, um, the European network doesn't have any, is not related to this. Um, and, but it means that sometimes life is a little bit more complicated. And uh, the interesting, um, th or the most uh, interesting thing is of course for, for you as a user that prices are a little bit different in those zones. So. Um, of course, because it like like um, uh, renting a server or renting re renting space in, in the U.S. is different than um, than paying for it in, in Europe or in Asia. So th those are the, the the reasons for the small differences. 
And, and within such a region, Amazon has multiple data centers, what um, you could call their availability zones. So they say, I have within um, like the US region, I have multiple such locations where you can start um, instances. Um, in reality, an availability zone is not exactly the same thing as a data center because multiple data centers can make up one availability zone. But um, the, the, the abstraction is good enough to think an availability zone equals a data center. Um, and so and it is within this availability zone where I start my machines, where I have my storage, where, um, where, every, where, where like the virtual f physical hardware um, really is. And um, so those are the available um, zones where you can start servers. So um, if, you, if you boot an instance, you have to choose where should it be. And um, as I said, those, those, difference, the, the, those different regions have different pricing, but it's a really, really minimal uh, difference. So you can decide, do I want to have my servers in the US because I have um, US customers and it's the cheapest zone, or do I want to have them in Europe because of uh, European privacy laws, because of regulation, or just because I have European customers where I want to have um, a good ping time. Um, but in every region, there are, different, there, there are multiple data centers for redundancy reasons, for scalability reasons, and um, also for organizational reasons within Amazon. So, um, that you have, they have data centers on the east coast of the, of the, um, of the um, US, on the west coast. The European servers are in Dublin. So Amazon is very um, secretive where they are exactly, but um, at least they say they are somewhere around Dublin. And uh, the, the Asian um, servers are in, in Singapore. So um, if, you, if you have an application, you have now to decide whether I want to, to, to boot my servers. I would say like in 99% in of, the, of the times you want everything within one of those availability zones. So it's the equivalent to say everything is, is one data center. I have, I have um, very nice ping times. Everything is, uh, is close to each other. Traffic is free. So with traffic within one uh, availability zone is, is completely free. Um, so it, it doesn't differ a lot from a typical setup where you rent a rack or you, you've rented like five, um, five machines somewhere and they're all in the same location. Um, but what Amazon allows you to do is to have more complex setups. So you can say, I don't want to rely on, on one availability zone and one data center. It could have um, a network problem. It could have um, like a problem in, in uh, availability. So it's, you can easily say, I want to have half my systems in one availability zone and the other half in another availability zone. And then you could use the Amazon load balancer to, to distribute the traffic between the, um, both of those. So even if, if like the, the right one has, is completely host, you can still deliver, um, deliver responses to your users. Of course, the big question is, how do I, how do I get this replication thing going? Right? Because the data doesn't magically travel from one, from one uh, data center to the other one. Um, if you use, so Amazon has a solution for this um, built in. If you use um, the hosted MySQL um, version from them, which I will talk about in a minute, but um, if you use some kind of a different database, um, or your own like uh, data storage, you have to come up with a solution. How do I make sure that I have a, like a duplicate in, in both data centers? If you use, if you use um, the, the hosted um, MySQL version, it's done for you, but um, if you use anything else, um, it's your problem. And this is the, the, basic, the basic idea with Amazon EC2. Amazon just takes care of booting a server for you. Everything else is your problem. There are, I mean, you can have a little bit of load balancing, you can have um, storage and so on, but, but Amazon doesn't automatically reconfigure uh, Apache for you or um, deploys your code or something like that. So um, everything up from the operating system level is your responsibility. So you still need um, an admin, you still need to do um, configuration work, you still need to deploy your latest version of the code. You still have to, to know, oh, my database server is down, maybe I should uh, boot a second one and replace it or something like that. Um, but the great thing is that you can do this automatically. So you can respond to it um, in an automated fashion. Um, so if, if, you, if you look at a bigger picture um, of, of your architecture, usually for a web application, you have something like this. So, so you have a load balancer that distributes um, your load on multiple application servers, and you have your, your database master, your database slave, and so on. And uh, probably you, you are uh, dumping regularly to, to something like Amazon S3. So not, not really different. The, the big difference is this, this monitoring component that usually you want to have in, in your system because what you can do is you can observe the individual components and see are they still there. If not, replace them with, with a working one or um, just add more application servers as the load is, is going up 
or uh, shut them down during the night if you, if you don't need them, for example. Um, so this is, this is what, what we do, but you can, of course, just have a development machine with, with the simpler thing that, that I saw um, was just a cron job that uh, in the morning at 8 o'clock boots up two machines and at, in the evening at 9 p.m. shuts them down because um, this is the load pattern of, of, of this application. And you, you only pay, of course, for those for the hours that, that you had the service. Um, so if, if you look at, at, at this um, architecture picture, there are like one or two things that are different from, from a normal data center. Um, one of those is the Elastic IP that you see on, on the left. And it is in, in, um, in Amazon, every machine that you boot has a random IP address. And you, you don't know the IP address beforehand. Um, which makes sense because, because Amazon cannot like reserve um, hundreds of, or thousands of IP addresses for you be, um, so because the IP addresses are spare. I think even like, uh, like the latest the, or the last IP, um, IP f uh, 4 block is, is, was allocated, so there are no IP addresses left. So Amazon only has like a, uh, like, uh, a couple of those if you want to. So, um, so every time you boot a server, you get a random IP address, which is uh, nice, of course, for your public website, right? You don't want to update DNS every, every now and then or so. Um, so in order to, to, um, to, to overcome this, um, there is the concept of elastic IPs, which means uh, a static IP address that you, that you maintain, that you can use for DNS, um, but it is, it is elastic because you can move it um, via an API call from one, one instance to the other. Um, that means usually you would use this for your load balancer or for your, for your uh, main web server or something like that. And you would use it in DNS, so your users don't have to like so you don't have to update DNS if anything changes. But you can migrate it dynamically from one instance to the other. So, for example, what it allows you to do is, um, if you're really paranoid um, during deployment, what you can do is clone this whole setup, boot up exa the exact copy of it, test the new version on it, check if everything is running smoothly, and if it does, switch the Elastic IP from the the old load balancer to the new one. And then see, is everything running fine on the new setup? Just shut down the old installation. And if it doesn't, switch it back. So maybe you, you paid like for an hour for like twice the sizes of the, the instances that you, need, you needed to have. Um, but it's only for an hour and, and the prices are like cents a minute. So maybe you spent like $10, $20 or something like that. Um, but you had a fully redundant setup with maybe 50 machines here and 50 machines there. Um, so this is the, the, the great thing about those Elastic IP addresses that you can allocate them and, and uh, change them via an API call. Um, the, 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 the interesting part, again, is you're paying for those if you're not using them, which, again, makes sense because Amazon wants to, to like, punish you if you, if you um, like, acquire a lot of those but don't use them because they're a spare uh, resource. Um, the, the other different thing is that um, there are two, two types of instances on Amazon. Um, the, older, the, the older instance type um, work, worked um, very similar to a live CD. To like if, you, if you insert a Linux live CD into your computer and you boot it up, you have like a complete fin uh, a version of Linux. You can do anything. You can, um, you can write to lot like your, your local disk. You can do anything that you want to. But if you shut down the, the machine, every changes are lost, right? And, th and this is um, like how most of the, the Amazon instances are, are used to work. The, um, um, by design, because of course, if you if you boot up a virtual machine you don't, and you shut it down, you don't want that the next um, person using the actual hardware underneath gets access to your own data, right? So it has to be deleted, um, which means um, it's probably not the best idea to to have my database server running like this, because if it's if it's crashing, if I just shut it down for the night, I don't want to lose all my data. Um, and and in order to to comprehend it, those are the you have the Elastic Block Store or the EBS drives. Um, so those are a net, uh, um, like, like very similar to iSCSI, for example. So you have a network block device that you can attach to a server. And this storage is permanent and redundant. Um, so in, in our example of the MySQL server, you would, um, you would say that my, um, my main database server has such a drive, and you store all the MySQL data on it. So you configure MySQL to store, please store the data under slash uh, volume slash data, for example, which is such an EBS drive. So if it crashes, you can just boot a second instance and remount this volume and all your data is still there. Or, or you can um, snapshot it and uh, create a new volume out of this snapshot and attach it to, to a new instance. So um, one thing that is a lot easier with, with things like that is 
MySQL replication, for example. MySQL replication is a pain in the ass to set up. And if you have a, lot, a large data set, um, it takes a lot of time to, to create a new slave. Because you have to do a dump on the master, which if you have a big data set, let's say it takes five hours and maybe blocks tables and you have uh, slower responses or maybe even downtime within those five hours. And then you have to copy over to, um, the, the stump to the slave over the network, which can take maybe uh, like 10, 15 minutes, maybe an hour if the, if the dump is so big. And then you have to reload um, the dump on the slave, which if the dump took five hours, reading the, um, like playing in the dump takes at least seven or eight hours. Um, so once the slave is, is like fully installed, you have already a replication lag of 13, 14 hours maybe. So it, has, it takes again an hour or so for the slave to keep up. And everything is manual and everything is, is uh, error prone and not, not very nice. Um, with EBS volumes, what you can do is just um, do a snapshot on the master, which takes, even on large disks, um, maybe a minute or two and is, is, is incremental. So if you already did one, doing the next one is, takes only a couple of seconds, depending on how much data you changed. And then you create a new volume out of this snapshot for the slave, which also, t also takes minutes or seconds. And then you have the slave boots up and has the exact copy, um, like uh, a bit for bit, all that the master had. So maybe you have, again, a replication lag of a minute or two, but not 13 hours. Um, the, the important thing to, to understand about those disks is that it's not um, a network file system. So it's not attachable to multiple servers at, um, at one time. So it's only one server can have this disk. So it's, it's not like NFS. It's more like, uh, like really a hard disk that you can, on, again, via an API call, put from one server to the other. Um, and this is also probably the the biggest drawback of Amazon EC2, that, um, that your disks are, are over the network, and that means that the performance is, of course, not the best. So if you have a very, very write-heavy MySQL setup, this will, the, this will be like your, your bottleneck. Um, so for most installations, it's not a problem, because most installations um, write to, to uh, MySQL, and data and indices fits in RAM, and you're not, depending, you're not blocking on the asynchronous um, MySQL threads that are writing it to disk. So usually that's not a problem, but if you're really, really write heavy, if you have like multiple thousands of, um, of write requests per second, this will, will kill you. Because, because you cannot just say, oh, let's buy a couple of SSDs and uh, like so solve the problem for a couple of months or something like that. Um, so if you have a very write heavy application, you should consider um, the, or test at least the performance of the EBS volumes. And what you can do in order to, um, to improve the performance is have a, um, a soft rate on top of those volumes. Um, you don't need it for, for redundancy reasons, but you, 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 can, you can improve or smoothen also performance. Um, because sometimes if you have like 10 disks every, every, um, on one machine, um, one can be randomly slow. Because um, or, or it's, a general, or it's a general effect in, in Amazon that if you have, like, for example, 50 machines, one, one of those will be a little bit slower than the others. Um, and it's, it's, it's just a, an inherent... inherent um, uh, characteristic of, of, of like a, a big data center as Amazon has, because if you have 10,000 of machines, or a hard, a physical machines with like, like if you have 10,000 machines, uh, uh, physical machines, let's say they have like then 60,000 virtual machines running on top of it, and if, if you're landing on a machine where somebody else is just like hammering the disk, your performance will of course, disk performance will of course also be worse. Um, so um, if you have, you, you should be used to like performance variation in, within Amazon. So if you have 50 machines, um, the, the chances are high that one or two will behave like 10% slower than the others. And uh, with EBS, it's, it's like especially painful if, you, if you're like waiting for, for disk seeks. Um, that's why um, a RAID volume can help a lot. Um, the, the other thing that Amazon um, offers you is, is the elastic load balancing, which um, simply means that, Amazon, that you can register instances, again via API call, that Amazon will automatically load balance. Um, and you, you, you distribute, um, you get a CNAME, a DNS CNAME to, that you, uh, that you um, distribute to your users. Um, because it's a very ugly one, of course, you, you just alias your like www.example.com to this load balancer CNAME, and then it uh, distributed, distributes traffic to your instances. Uh, the great thing about it is that it can start and stop instances uh, depending on their load. So you can say, I, wanna, I have like um, a pool, an auto-scaling pool of instances, and I want to start and stop them depending on, on how, like how big the CPU consumption, RAM consumption, and so, so on is. Um, in practice, we see a lot more, lot, a lot more people using like an, an actual instance with a software load balancer on top of it, 
instead of those because you have a fine, more fine grained control which URLs I want to send to which backends, um, what do, um, do I want to um, use sticky sessions but only for those URLs and for those backend services. So if you have a more complex um, application, usually um, you tend to use your own load balancing and then maybe in front of it for redundancy reasons you have um, the, the Amazon load balancing. Uh, the only the, the, the only disadva big disadvantage that, that you have is, of course, if you do software load balancing in one instance, you cannot um, scale past one gigabit per second, because every instance has uh, just a gigabit network card. So if you if you use it as a load balancer, this is like your your um, your, your single point of failure for network um, traffic. So ev every traffic goes through your instance, and that means if you have more than one gig per second, um, you have to to use multiple ones, or you you use the, the LB ones. Um, but then, as I said, one gig per second, you have to be really big to, to have so much traffic. Um, the other interesting um, thing that Amazon offers is the relational data store, which, um, as I said, you, you get from, what you get from Amazon is uh, an instance where you have root access. So you can log in, configure MySQL, and there you have your, your database server. Um, but as we, as we just uh, um, learned, like, MySQL replication is really a pain in the ass. And that's why Amazon has like, a hosted MySQL installation. So they will take care of all the uh, um, installation and configuration of MySQL. They will take care of, um, of updating it if there are security patches. And uh, the, the very interesting thing is that they will take care of instant instantiating new, new read slaves or uh, even a master-master setup. Um, so this is very, very easy with, with their setup to say, I want to have like two uh, new read slaves, and within minutes you get them. It's only an API call to, to call for them. And uh, behind the scenes, Amazon is doing the, exactly the same things that I just uh, told you, like doing the snapshot, mounting the other EBS volume and so on, but you don't, don't have to, to deal with it. Um, especially for, for like master-master replications across multiple data centers, um, it's very, very nice because you, in reality you're talking to a MySQL proxy installation, a custom MySQL proxy um, that uh, Amazon wrote, and they're distributing the, the queries to all masters. So even if, uh, if the master and one availability zone is down, um, you're transparently being redirected to the other one. And as soon as it, um, it's um, up again, um, Amazon will sync the data. Um, so it's, they're not using the... the um, the MySQL standard replication for this, they, they use the, their own proxy installation or, um, and, um, for this, which means that you have really synchronous master-master setups. Um, the big drawback is that you have to, to define a four-hour window within every week where Amazon can do maintenance work. So where can they, in theory, like take down your database, install patches, or move it from one physical box to another one because the, uh, one, the, the, the first box has problems. And four, four hours is like a lot of time. Uh, and, and I never saw them really, uh, really, really use the, the full extent of four hours. Um, but you, what we can do against it is to have this master-master um, setup. And what Amazon, of course, will do is they do maintenance work on one master, transparently redirect it to the other one, and then bring this back up again, trans, uh, transparently redirect it to the other one, and do the maintenance work on the on the on the one that you just used. Um, but of course, the, the drawback is you have to pay for both, so you have two instances. Um, but if you have complex MySQL installations, this is definitely a thing that you, that you should have a look at it because you don't have to hassle with, um, with replication setups, replication flags, and, and instantiating a new, a new um, read slave or something like that um, yourself. So I've been talking a lot about all those, those instances. Um, what, can, what kind of instances can you start on Amazon? Uh, Amazon has nine different types of servers. And there is no, no, uh, no, no other instance type that you can choose from. So you either choose pick one of those, or you, you, um, th there is nothing else on Amazon. So um, you cannot say, "Oh, I want to have this instance, but I will pay you 200 bucks if you like stick SSDs into it, or give me a little bit more RAM or so." So th those are the, the only instance types that you have. Um, they start with small, tiny, and uh, a slow, but cheap, up to very, very big, very expensive. And you, you have to you, you can choose what kind of workload do I have. Um, what fits my problem best, what fits my budget, and then decide what you use. Um, the, the great thing is that, that running one instance, 1,000 hours, costs us exactly the same as running 1,000 instances for one hour. So you can, you can tackle um, very, very different uh, problems than, than before. Um, 
what, what you're always like committed to is one hour. So if you, if you have an instance that's running for 30 minutes, you also pay the, the hourly price for, for a full hour. If you have an instance that runs for like one hour, 59 minutes, you pay for two. Um, so this, this is the hourly price. And if you, if you say, okay, if I run it like 24 seven for 30 days a week, this is um, uh, 30 days a month, this would be the, the monthly price. Which um, I don't know how it is in, in, uh, in the UK, but in Germany, this is um, like, not the cheapest kind of hosting that you can get. So um, in, in, in Germany, we, get, we have a lot of um, very cheap hosting companies where I can get like a machine that is a, like roughly as fast as this one for maybe, maybe 100 euros or something like that, or even, even a lot cheaper. Um, but the, the, the great thing to, to keep in mind is that this is if you, you, you committed yourself for an hourly price, so you can shut it down if you don't need to. You can just have those on demand. Um, there, is, there is also... Um, a different um, mode of of, um, of acquiring those, and this is are the reserved instances. So the the price list that I just so showed you is the on demand list price if you commit for one hour. Yeah, so you can stop using you can boot one thousand instances and say I don't want them after one hour, and Amazon has to take them back, and you only paid for for one hour. Um, but what you can do is commit for for a longer time for a longer time period and then um, uh, save money on, because Amazon um, offers you lower rates. So, so for example, um, if I have a small web application, I will always run my database master, right? I, will, uh, I don't shut it down during the night because my users cannot um, access anything. Um, so if I have a, a, like a minimal setup, like one load balancer, two web, web um, server, and a database server, and I will run them always, and then I have a couple of servers only like uh, coming and going depending on my load, um, it makes sense to, to purchase this reservation for, for those instances. And how it works is that you, you make up, if you buy such a reservation, you make upfront um, a commitment. So you pay like, um, a, again, depending on the instance size. So for example, um, for the small instance, it is um, for a year roughly 240 or $250. So you, you pay those um, immediately. And then Amazon lowers the, the hourly rate to uh, roughly a third of what it was before. Um, that means if you do this for one year, you save 25% um, of, of the cost if you run it 24-7. Um, and if you do this for three years, you're saving uh, nearly 50%. So those numbers could be, as, uh, can, could be down by 50% if you commit yourself um, for a longer time period. The other difference um, that the reserv reservation gives you is a guaranteed availability. Um, and what I mean by that is... If, you, if, I, if I would now go to Amazon and say, give me 1,000 machines of this instance type in this data center, the, probably I will like, get only at most 100 or so at, at, uh, immediately. And then Amazon will tell me um, either try a different instance type or try a different availability zone or wait a couple of minutes until, um, until we reshuffled um, the, the VM sizes. Because Amazon, of course, cannot have like, thousands of, of spare machines just there waiting. They're, they're running a business, so they have to like, always try to, to keep the unutilized number of machines as small as possible. Um, so if, you, if you're booting like a, a very big number of machines uh, immediately, you, uh, Amazon doesn't have all of the spec um, capability. So eventually they will have it. So they, um, or you can choose, like you distribute it over different availability zones or choose a different instance type. Um, but if you have this reservation, you're also buying the guarantee that you, that you will start, be able to start this, this instance. And for some people, this is important. For, for others, maybe not. But um, especially if you're if you like having like a disaster recovery plan for, you, for your company or so, you want to be sure that if I really need to migrate all my, my, my servers over, I want to have them immediately and not maybe like 10 minutes later or something like that. Um, so it's, it's definitely recommended if, for your minimal setup in order, in order for you to save money. Um, the, the, the big thing to, to understand with Amazon is that you're not that you, that the, the the paradigm is is a very very different from your typical hosting. You're not committed to one machine. Yeah, you, you didn't lease or, 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 or bought this machine, and if it has a problem, it is your problem. Yeah, like in traditional hosting. In traditional hosting, if if I if I bought this server and it has a hardware failure, it's my problem. Yeah, I have downtime, so I have to. Either get my support guys, or like call the the, the the data center, or or they of course if it's a good data center and they pay a lot for support, they notice it. So somebody has, but somebody has to go there, swap the hard drive. Um, then I have it like um, I have to play back my, my backup um, 
and then maybe a couple of hours, depending on how, how, um, how much uh, money I pay, how good the support is, um, I have back my machine and uh, everything is working again on, on this machine. But it's my problem. I have downtime. On Amazon EC2, if this server has a problem, or even if I only suspect that it has a problem, I just take another one. I, there's nothing that, that I'm attached to on this machine, yeah? Because I just rent the, the computing capability that, that I specified. And if, if this one doesn't satisfy me, I can just like boot a second machine, migrate my data, so like remount this volume on the other one, and maybe take even the IP address with me, and then shut down the other one. So you, you're not committed to, to like a physical instance, you, you're just you're renting computing power. And that means that you can, you can migrate from one data center to the other one very easily. That um, you can, as I said, spawn up test setups or staging setups and that just use them for a short um, period of time. Um, but the, the, the biggest problem is still, how do I boot and reconfigure and deploy my application to, to, to such an, to such an, um, an architecture? Um, so how do I get from this, from this blank Linux server to my, my fully configured web server with PHP, with then Zend running on it, with my libraries, with my versions of, of my code? Uh, and this is like the, the, the bigger hurdle. Because the other one is, is the other process is not different from you buying a server and, and racking it than to just making an API call and you have the machine. Um, so of course you can you can go in and manually configure it and log in via SSH, do like apt-get install Apache and uh, apt-get install mod PHP and uh, uh, configure everything by hand. Um, but but you, you're not really really getting the benefits that you could have because because man, this manual process is slow. And if, you, if you're going to Amazon, you want to, to be able to like, just automatically boot up machines. So if, if you have like your page is slashed out at 3 o'clock in the morning, you want it to boot up new machines, and those have to be ready. You don't want to, be, to like call your admin and say, log in, configure those, we have to use them, right? Um, so you have to automate all of this. In general, there are like two approaches um, that you can do. Um, the first approach is you do everything out base of images. Um, so very similar to if you if you run VMware locally, it's a very similar approach. Yeah, you you first you ch you take the, the the default image that Amazon gives you. Um, there are also a lot of images um, from like every major um, Linux distribution has like a, a public image. So you can use the SUSE image, you can use the Debian image, you can use the Red Hat image or Fedora image, and you boot this up, log in via SSH, do all the the installation configuration, then you save it again this image and say I want to save it for later use, and this is like my web server. So if you boot it up at three o'clock in the morning, you don't boot the blank um, image, but you boot your pre-configured one. Um, this is, uh, is like the, the, the process how most of the people start to work with Amazon, but it, it's also the, the least flexible approach because um, you need an image for your web server, you need an image for your um, load balancer, you need an image for your database server, you need an image for your caching server, you need an image for your index server, and you need an image for 32-bit and for 64-bit. And uh, as I said before, uh, the, the, the Amazon installations are different, so you would have to copy all of those images to every region uh, in Amazon where you, where you have servers. And imagine now you have a staging setup where in, on staging it is okay if my database server and my caching server and my web server are all in the same machine, so I save money because I don't need like 10 machines. So you need again another image for this. And then there comes a security patch for, for a library that you're using, and you have to update 20 images. Um, so the, 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 uh, um, the better approach is to use some kind of a scripting, scripted provisioning, where you take the, the, um, the base image that the Linux distribution gives you, and on demand you form it to, to be your uh, application server of choice, your web server, my configured uh, installation. And this, this allows you to, to dynamically re-adapt the roles to, like, if there is a new version of Ubuntu, you don't have to update your 20 images. You just choose the new base image, test of your scripts already, uh, still work with it, and then you just like switch one small variable, like the ID of the image that you're using. Um, um, the, the disadvantage is, of course, that, that the learning curve is a little bit higher because you have to, to have some kind of a, um, of a provisioning framework. And of course, if you're always booting, uh, installing everything on boot, it takes like a minute or two longer for your instances to be provisioned. Um, but it really pays off. So how do you, how do, we do this? Um, my weapon of choice for doing this is Chef. Chef is an, an open source provisioning tool. Um, there, there are others like uh, CF Engine or Puppet, which are like a little bit um, older and, and therefore a little bit more widespread. 
Um, Chef um, allows you to, to define how you, you want your server to look like in a Ruby DSL. Um, the great thing about it is that you don't have to be a Ruby programmer to understand it, but if you know a little bit of Ruby, you can easily extend it and, and very, very easy um, sparkle like arbitrary functionality onto it. Um, and what it does is you give, you, you, you give it a definition of how do I want my server to look like, what kind of packages do I want to have installed, what kind of services should be running, what kind of users should be there locally, what should uh, the MySQL configuration look like, and so on. And it will then, independent of the operating system, so it supports uh, like all Linux flavors, it supports um, FreeBSD, it supports macOS, and so on. It will then do whatever it has to do in order to, to um, bend your system so that it looks like this. Um, there are two, two different setups how you can, can uh, work with Chef. Um, the far more complicated one, but if you have a big installation, um, the one you should use is the client-server installation, where you have a, um, like a, um, a central Chef server where you keep the configuration, and it's called in Chef speak cookbooks and recipes. We'll have a look at uh, this in a minute, but I will. I, I always like maintaining here uh, this repository of cookbooks of definitions. How do I install Memcached? How do I configure Apache? And then all my my maybe hundreds, thousands of nodes. They connect to it and they pull the latest configuration and then they apply it locally. So you, you update the configuration in one place and it, the clients, uh, after a couple of minutes, they pick it up and reconfigure themselves. If, for example, so if you decided I need a new um, PHP model on all my web servers, you add it in this configuration and a couple of minutes later, every machine installs it, unintended. Um, if you start up to play with Chef, you should um, do it with Chef Solo, so it's a very, very a lot simpler. Um, what you do is you just call Chef manually on the command line, and it gives it as an input the configuration file, but it has to have everything locally uh, pre-installed. But it's a lot simpler to start out and play with Chef. And if you only have like a handful of machines, um, um, you can just have a simple SSH script that logs into your five machines and call this calls Chef with um, with a Solo configuration. So it's it's a lot simpler to to start out and experiment um, if you don't have this server component. Um, yeah, so how does a chef um, recipe look like? Um, this is a, an example. How do I, I bootstrap memcached on my machine? Um, I don't, don't think that you guys at the end can, can read this, but what you, don't, you don't have to understand every line, but what should ho hopefully become clear is it's a very simple DSL. Yeah? So at the top I define, I want to have the package memcached installed. I want to have the package um, uh, lib memcached dev installed, and uh, there is a service called memcached on the machine. And then I, I generate the template um, Etsy memcached conf, and I tell it what kind of, uh, who should be the owner of the file, what kind of permissions should it have, and I can put variables into this template. So not, nothing too complicated. And I, I do the same thing for, um, for the uh, Etsy default memcached configuration. And so this would be an example, how do I bootstrap memcached? How to make sure that all machines that should be running memcached do it exactly like I configured it to. Um, and once I have this, this recipe, as it is it called in Chef, I can now trigger a Chef run that, that executes it. So how does it look like? Um, I have a, a JSON configuration file, and the important part is this recipes that tells it um, what kind of, of scripts should, I, should it run, in this case memcached, and I can put arbitrary, um, arbitrary data in it that I can then pick out of on, in Chef. So in this case I define I have a, a memcached user called nobody, a port, and, and uh, memory, and this is the information that I can query, query here. So I don't hard code on, on, uh, how much memory should, should every machine have, but I can pass it as an argument. Um, and then once I have this configuration file, I just, I just execute, uh, in this case, chef solo locally. Um, so it, I just call chef solo, pass it the, um, and pass it this JSON file, and then it will uh, do the magic it has to do. So um, it, will, it will execute this recipe, and depending on the, on the machine it is running on, it will do the right thing. So if we are on a Debian uh, um, machine, it will use um, apt-get to install memcached. If we are on a SUSE, it will use zipper to install memcached. If we are um, on an Open Solaris machine, it will use the Open Solaris package manager to do this. Um, so it's a great way to write um, like operating system independent installation um, scripts. How do, how do I make my local system look like it should be? Um, there is even support for deploying. <coughs> Uh, this is not really, really readable, but I don't know um, like if Capistrano, which is a very popular deployment tool that, that came out of, of the Ruby world, but it's also used by a lot of PHP guys, 
Um, so it, it has a compatible um, mode for this. Um, yeah, you cannot read it, but there is one. Um, so Chef is, is very, very good in order to, to bootstrap the machine, but you can also do deployment over it. Um, so Chef is great from, from my experience. You should definitely check it out, even if you don't use Amazon, but if you have a large a number of machines to, to manage and install. Um, the, 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 the only like two small things about it is that it's, it's not completely idempotent. So if you define like a directory should be, should be there and should have like this own and this, um, this permissions, and it's not already existing, Chef will of course uh, create it with the correct permissions and owner uh, settings. But if it's already there, um, it would just say, oh, it's, I skipped it and uh, I didn't change anything, Every, even if the owner is a different one. So there are one or two like resources in Chef that are not uh, item po uh, potent. And, um, and it has like two phases that it, that it executes in, which um, I don't think that we have time to talk about uh, now. But um, I'll, so you have to know that Chef runs in two phases. Uh, otherwise, you will have surprising, thanks, surprising um, effects. Um, but the, the, the great thing is there are a lot of open source recipes. There are a lot of like open source best practices. How do you bootstrap Zen to the uh, server, for example, the community edition? How do I install my SQL and so on? So um, there's a lot, there are a lot, a lot of recipes and resources out there that you can just copy paste um, and use. But with everything that you copy paste and use, um, there are better and worse examples. Um, yeah. So if if you if you look at uh, like at our checklist, we, kn we we now know how to. What kind of architecture should we use? Where should we start the service? And we um, now, how do we deploy and bootstrap the, the, the machines? And I want to, to close with, with an example, um, a use case that, um, of, of some clients of ours that, that um, like displays what you can really do with, with a setup like this. Um, so the project that, that I'm going to, to show you some interesting numbers is a browser game that is completely hosted on EC2. Um, this is um, a Facebook game by VUGA. VUGA is the world of gaming. They are the biggest um, European social gaming site. They are like uh, uh, wannabe Zyngas, if you want to, yeah? But uh, they are like in the top 10 of, 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 um, of uh, worldwide in, in, in social games on Facebook. So for this game, they have one to two million daily active users. So on every day, there are over one million different users playing this game, which is uh, not a small number. And they have roughly 130 machines in this cluster and uh, roughly 120,000 requests per minute. So pretty impressive numbers. And if you, if you look at the, at the load curve, it looks something like this. So this is um, one part of the, the Apache cluster, and uh, this is one week. So if you guys at the end cannot see the, the, um, the scale, so we have like one week um, being printed here. So, so as you can see, they have a very distinct load pattern. And it's very simple to explain because they have a mostly European user base. So, of course, people are playing in the late afternoon, early evening, and not so many users are playing at 3, three in the morning. Um, if you would use traditional um, hosting, at the, at the peak they have like roughly 6,000 uh, 6, requests per second on their Apaches. If, you, if I would use traditional hosting, I would have, have servers for at least like 10% over this peak if I'm depending on how much growth I anticipate, how conservative I am. Um, but it means that all of those like, wide um, areas would be like lost money, yeah? sunk cost, because I, I bought servers that I don't need during those times. Yeah? This is the minimum number of servers that I need, but I would have like, enough to, to, um, to be able to serve the, my peak traffic. But I would pay, I would pay my, my, uh, my cooling bill, I would pay uh, rent for the racks, I would pay uh, um, my leasing fee for the servers, I would pay my admins that don't have to do anything, like if I, if I had a peak times 130 servers, I need more admins, of course, that I, if I have only 20. So in, th in those times, I, I, um, my money is just wasted, right? Um, so this is a perfect example that you could utilize with Amazon EC2. Um, so if you look at the, what they're actually doing, and the important line is, is the red one, the red line is the number of, of um, cores that are running, the number of CPUs active in the cluster, and most importantly, the number of CPUs that are actually paying for. Um, and it, it goes from, from roughly 250 to 520. So they're, they're cutting the, the, the fleet in half during the night, and then slowly, slowly bringing them up again um, if, they need more, if they have more traffic. 
And this way, they, they save around 40% on the infrastructure cost just by being able to, um, to shut down everything they don't need during the night and uh, being also able to, to easily adapt to, to load fluctuations. So if they, if they have like a big marketing campaign, they can easily boot up another 10 or 20 machines just to cope for this one or two days with the extra load and uh, then get rid of the machines once they don't need them. Yeah, so this, this was my, my closing slide. Any, are there any questions? Yes, please. Just wait a minute, I think, for the mic. Yeah. Um, when developing a PHP application for use in this environment, this clustered environment, what do you have to consider when building your PHP application um, in, in terms of managing sessions, etc., um, uh, so, managing yeah, state? Yeah, so um, the, 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 um, the easier you want your application to scale, um, the, the more you should be, build, um, be, be building it stateless. So, so um, sticky sessions are a bad idea if servers are disappearing, uh, if load goes down. Um, so you, you, you need, of course, um, one central uh, store for, for sessions, so something like memcached or Redis maybe, because it's persistent. <coughs> and uh, session stickiness is something that your application should not rely on to, because otherwise you cannot as easily shut, them, uh, shut the instances down um, as you need to. Um, the other thing is that you should you should try to make your, your application very easily configurable and not like hard code IP addresses everywhere and uh, just assume that once I know where, where like my caching server is, it will never change or something like that. Because on Amazon, it of course, like in every environment, machines can crash. It's not like they're crashing more often on Amazon, but um, it is that you want them to disappear. If you have today 10 memcache servers, during the night you need only two. Or to marry tomorrow, there is... Um, a big uh, spike in, in load, so you, you need maybe 12. So you should, be, it should um, make it very easy to, to reconfigure your application from the outside. So um, the first step is, of course, to, on simplest step, is to just have everything in config files and separate config files that, that your scripts can write whenever they change your architecture. Um, a more complex solution would be to be able to configure them uh, um, automatically. So for example, um, I don't know if you, you saw the talk before about ZeroMQ, where you can, for example, every ap um, application also has a ZeroMQ socket where you can push configuration changes. So you, you make it very easy to, to change your application and, and not, don't hard code the, the, the structure. Um, if, you're, if you're running on those scales, um, re relying on one, on, on, on one database server is also a big problem. So um, the, the hardest part is always um, um, solving the, the scalability of the data. So um, just one big uh, MySQL server is not enough. Maybe um, it is, but uh, like for, for a short period of time. But on Amazon, you, you cannot just say, my database server maxed out uh, its RAM, so let's just buy another 100 gigs of um, RAM and put it in. Because Amazon, the biggest uh, installation that you get is um, 68 gigs of RAM. So if you know it, it's going to be like a problem for you in a, in a year or something, you can speculate that Amazon will offer then a bigger uh, instance. But the better solution would be to um, be able to scale horizontally. Um, especially also because, as I said, um, I.O. is not the best on Amazon, so you, you don't want to, your application to rely on a very small number of components where you need very, very high performance on each, but you want to have an application where you have multiple smaller components that I can easily distribute, that can easier shut maybe half of those down and something like that. Um, so you, you need to be the, build an application that is more distributed and, and, and smaller, and smaller um, components that you can, can move from one place to another. And don't hard code the hard code uh, the interfaces between those. There's another question. Um, can you talk about the terms and conditions that Amazon impose on the type of applications you can run? So, for example, I'm thinking of writing a, uh, a web scraper that scrapes Google's for page rankings for um, SEO uh, perspective. So, have you ever done anything like that before? Yeah, we've done something like that. So, so Amazon gives you a, um, like a, really a root server, so you have total root access to it. So they, they don't restrict you um, by, um, technically to do anything. The only, technically, uh, the only technical thing that they restrict you on is sending mail. So by default, um, you cannot make too many um, outgoing connections on port 25, and uh, so they, they, they will s uh, slow you down. But you can, there is a form where you can apply to say, no, it's legit legitimate traffic, and uh, I need this for project X or something like that, and then you, they, they will um, increase your quota. But uh, ru uh, running like very big mail servers on EC2 is probably not the best idea, especially because um, 
it's as every instance has a dynamic um, it, um, has a um, random IP address allocated. So a lot of um, blacklists have like um, all ins Amazon of ins uh, all Amazon instances on their blacklist by default because it's a dynamic um, IP range, just like dial-up connections. So they say, okay, by default you're getting like two points on spam assessment just for being in the EC being in EC2. Uh, that's so that's another uh, another thing why you don't want to run um, like big mail server installations on Amazon. As, as also Amazon now offers um, an API for sending mail, so you don't need to do this yourself. Um, but other than that, there is no big big limit. So you can install anything that you want. The the biggest problems are usually not technical, but but um, like internal uh, business policies that, that like for example, there's still um, a lot of software that that you are, um, that you buy licenses um, for for a core, um, for example, that um, don't easily allow you to 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 um, if you have one license to say, but I, I have a one license for like an eight core machine, but I want to run it on on Amazon, uh, like on eight machines with, with only one core, on what what do I, does happen if I shut four of those uh, down during the night? Does my license fee go, uh, halves? Yeah. So um, the, there there is software um, out of, uh, from the so the vendors are responding to this. So you can, for example, start a pre-configured instance on Amazon where you pay a lot a little bit more money and the license fee is included. So for example, the the, the Windows instances are a little bit cheap, uh, ex more expensive than the Linux ones. Because um, they include um, they include the license fee for Windows. Same with Oracle. So some vendors already have like an, uh, a different image that you that you start that you use, and it is a little bit more expensive because the license fee is included. But technically, there is no like Amazon doesn't say you don't uh, uh, you, you cannot run anything compute intensive or something like that. Um, they have a couple of of policies around like. Uh, uh, a poor and something like that. So they 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 have like things in that uh, in their um, terms and services that say you are not allowed to 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 run applications that do like something harmful against the U.S. government or, or something like that. But what every U.S. hoster would have, um, but nothing like technically limit limiting. Hi, um, you know, using this type of like setup, would it be more practical sometimes to use um, Amazon Simple DB or like a key value storage like Redis um, rather than using MySQL? Would that become something more yeah, practical? Yeah, yeah. So, so um, MySQL, MySQL has has like a scalability problem across multiple nodes. So, MySQL is designed to run to run fast and efficient on one of one instance, and everything that tries to spend it across multiple nodes is so, so like replication of MySQL is not the best thing. There is no multi-node solution, a really nice one. Um, so um, if, you, if you can, uh, but uh, the, the other benefit of MySQL is of course it's, it's SQL, you have transactions, you have like um, durability and so on. It's a very un uh, well understood technology. You have a lot of, of, lot of uh, drivers for it. Um, but this is like the part of, of, of a lot of those uh, databases from the NoSQL movement where you say, um, but I wanted to be able to just like start more instances and be those just my database just uses them, right? So um, in all the setup that I just saw, like the database instances, if you use MySQL, they are static. Yeah, I cannot just like have three and during the, the night one and during peaks ten or something like that. Yeah, doesn't work with MySQL, unfortunately. Um, there are databases where it works like this. So uh, React, for example, or Cassandra, or CouchDB with Big Couch, where you can add dynamically multiple nodes and they will sync the, um, internally and then they will be available and your data automatically partitions um, itself. Um, so if, if you can use something like that, um, it's, it's a very good solution to the scaling problem. Usually they have other um, drawbacks, like um, response time is slower because um, you, you're t talking to one node, maybe this node doesn't have your data, so it has to fetch your data from somewhere else. And maybe you have to, like, um, to uh, go to multiple nodes or something like that. So um, there are always like, advantages, advantages and disadvantages, but um, MySQL is, of co is, is not like best fit a uh, uh, best fit database for a problem where you dynamically spawn servers and then they go away it's the last question guys okay in in terms of the elastic balancer and the elastic ip would yep. the outgoing traffic appear from the same ip so if you were pushing content out would that appear from a single ip or would the random ip allocation um, if, if you use the, um, your own software load balancer with an elastic IP um, stuck, to, uh, it's, uh, stuck to it, it will always be from the, from the same IP. Um, if you use the elastic load balancer, 
Um, it could have multiple ones because um, what Amazon does is if you, if you have um, high traffic behind it, it will spawn multiple load balancer instances and use DNS round robin to distribute your traffic on, um, on them. And then you can have responses from multiple IP addresses. Yeah, but that'll be, that'll be incoming traffic. What about outgoing traffic? How would you make sure that it always comes back from one originating IP? It, it, so if you use the load balancing, of the, your, your outgoing traffic is also going through the load balancer. If you so like it, HTTP it. response request cycle. If you do something uh, like, like random API calls from, from your web services out to somewhere else, of course, um, the, the, the traffic always originates at the, at the, at the node that you're using. Um, if you change, so you, have, you would have to change your routing if you, don't, if you want to do it uh, otherwise. Um, but if you have like 100 um, application servers and every application server within the, the request that they have to answer to the, to the um, HTTP client makes, has to have make like um, an API call to your payment gateway or something like that. Um, you would have like 100 different IP addresses randomly hitting your payment gateway. Um, so usually um, this would be a place where you, you would configure your load balancer to like all, um, all requests that have something like slash payment in the, in the um, uh, URL go on to, only to one special instance. And this special instance has an elastic IP that you whitelist with your payment provider, for example. And this way you make sure that, that uh, only, you only have one IP address. But, um, by default, um, if you have 100 instances and every instance is allowed to make requests somewhere, of course, uh, there, there is no automatic routing that, that changes um, the, the, the responses to go through one instance. Right. Okay. 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 Run out in time. So. Yeah. Thank you very okay. much.